Welcome to Breakdown to Breakthrough podcast with Janie Morris. It's wonderful to have your company once again, or if this is the very first time that you have tuned into our podcast, welcome. And I hope you do enjoy uh, what we have for you today. But also, if you haven't seen or heard of any of our other podcasts, and it is your very first time, please just simply go back to our website at janiemorris.com to the podcast section, or of course, wherever you get your favorite podcasts, uh, because we're on all of them now. So worldwide, we'd love your feedback. We'd love your comments. Make sure that you share this podcast as well. But for today, I'm very, very excited about um, my very special guest that I have today on our Breakdown to Breakthrough podcast. Dr. James Mukey is uh, somebody who is um, uh, now. I don't want to use. I don't want to use the words not just a doctor um, because <laughs> he has so many layers to not only who he is as a person, but what he does and what he is doing in the future for communities worldwide. And so we invited Dr. James Mukey to be our guest today because. He's got a lot to offer and we have got a lot of questions for him. Seeing it's a very short podcast today, he was the Australian of the Year for 2020. He's the Lieutenant Governor of South Australia currently. So we're going to ask him a little bit more about that as well. He's Chairman for Sight for All, also co-founder, uh, Director of MedThink, ophthalmologist, eye surgeon, social entrepreneur. He's been fighting blindness for over 30 years. He's a passionate photographer photographer and he's passionate about all things in life. Welcome James. Thank you Jenny, what an intro, thank you. Uh, great to be on your podcast on this very chilly South Australian morning. <laughs> well, I'm glad to have you with us. Now James, let's dive right into it. Um, first of all, just for our audience, if you wouldn't mind just giving a little bit of your background and then we're going to delve into who you are and what you're doing in the future. So uh, yeah, I'm an eye surgeon. I've been in the eye surgery space for 32 years. I've been in the medical space for 40 years. And as you mentioned, I'm the co-founder of Sight for All, which is a social impact organization dedicated to fighting blindness. We have projects uh, either past or present in 10 countries in Asia, uh, also uh, now into Africa and in mainstream and Aboriginal communities in Australia and impacting on about a million plus people every year. So it's uh, been a, a labor of love for, of mine for uh, quite some time now, 15 years since we founded Site for All and uh, it's growing and it's uh, been a, an all consuming, but a very, a very special part of my life. So, so Site for All then, is it, um, uh, what exactly, can we peel back a few layers on that? Just to, just to give us a little bit more of an insight on that because it's a fascinating, it's fascinating work that you're doing worldwide. Absolutely. So we have four key strategies uh, in our fight against blindness, and uh, they are research, collaborative research, sustainable education, supporting that education with equipment and infrastructure, and also raising awareness. And I can just give you one example, which really captures what we do. So I was involved in a childhood blindness study in Myanmar back in 2007, and it involved assessing children at uh, all of the schools sort of lined across the country. And the results were really quite staggering and quite uh, powerfully disturbing. We found that uh, nearly half the kids had blindness that could have been prevented or treated. So half were needlessly blind, shouldn't even be in those schools. Uh, but what was really, really disturbing was the lead cause of blindness that we found, which was measles. Now imagine most of the viewers wouldn't even be aware that measles could cause blindness, let alone know what it looks like, but it blinds in the most painful uh, and horribly disfiguring and permanent way. And so for me to be surrounded by, by children uh, across this country and also in, in a couple of other countries where we undertook studies in Cambodia and Laos, you know, has been one of the most powerful moments in my, my medical career and particularly my ophthalmic career. And so on the back of that really powerful study, uh, I actually went back and met with the health minister. We were able to persuade uh, the health authorities to train a children's eye specialist for the country. And so we, in 2010, brought a young ophthalmologist to 
to Adelaide to train at the Women's and Children's Hospital, hands-on, um, and he returned at the end of the year as the very first children's eye specialist for his country, and um, we set him up in the country's first children's eye centre. So that really is research, education, and, and supporting the education with the infrastructure. And now he, um, in 2015, he finished training the second uh, paediatric ophthalmologist for his country, and he now trains at least two every year. And so he himself is impacting on close to 30,000 kids every year, which is quite staggering. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just, I, I think, really captures the sustainability of our educational program that I could probably give you another hundred or so uh, examples that, that uh, are similar, but it, it's just, I think really, it really shows you how all of those key hallmarks of the work that we do um, brings it to life. James, it's incredibly powerful work and, and listening to you um, with that, that incredible example as well i mean congratulations on that um and the impact that that is making as you say especially on on children uh in in those areas listening to that many of us and i'm guilty of it as well as i was just listening to you then many of us would not even be aware that um these type of um health issues this the the eye issues are even occurring because would, would it be safe to say that me, most in the community are, you know, just a little bit uh, desensitized to it or, or not desensitized, but perhaps um, just think, well, you know, this wouldn't be happening in today's day and age with medical technology and advances and things like that. Yeah, well, it shows you that there are many very poor countries in the world that are absolutely lacking in resources. And, and even for me, as, as an eye surgeon, to be a part of that study, as I said, it was a very disturbing experience for me. And at the end of the day, each of our days, the, uh, the group of us were, you know, have heads in hands and tears in our eyes, because what we had seen. So even for myself, you know, knowing that measles was a blinding disease, but to actually see it, you know, firsthand was just, wow, you know, incredible. But the other thing that was really really powerful was that we found children uh, in those schools who were visually impaired even blind because they'd never been tested for spectacles so here we have two highly preventable but potentially blinding conditions uh, uh, it, it, and um, you know it does make you realize how powerful prevention is in medicine and we were able to as a result of those studies you know put it in place mechanisms to make sure that this never happens again and and it, interestingly pediatric ophthalmology is just one of 10 specialties in my profession and so we've been training and equipping across all of the other subspecialties as well as into optometry so optometry is very important as well of course because you know if you have a country where there's no optometrists available and, and children aren't getting glasses uh, or adults aren't getting glasses you know when you don't have your you don't have your reading glasses on it's quite handicapping once you're really 40 so you know it's uh, it's, it's wonderful when to see the impact then of the work we did we actually went back in 2018 to do a follow-up study and the level of avoid avoidable blindness is dropping because of of the um this incredible young man his name's Tan Tun Ong and uh you know we've actually calculated the cost of our investment to train and equip him and it's costing well under a dollar for every child that he's now treating and and that continues to get less as he trains more of his colleagues and collectively they tr tr um, treat more children and uh it just as the pandemic was breaking out in February two years ago, I came back from Myanmar uh, filming a documentary about his work and we're in post-production at the moment. And I'm really excited to actually share that documentary when it's done my son's actually uh, directing and been very much involved in that project as well. Oh, that, well, well, that is exciting news. And we look forward to uh, uh, finding out all the details of when that's going to be aired and, and when we can actually promote that for you as well. James, um, uh, Australian of the Year 2020. Let's let's have a let's have a conversation around that. Um, the, this the award, both the state Australia, uh, you know, like you were South Australian, um, South Australian uh, of the Year. Um, each state gets gets one of those individuals every year, but the highest honour there, obviously, the Australian of the Year is 
is a fantastic acknowledgement and we've seen over the years of the individuals that have all been involved in that of the impacts that they all make on an individual basis let's talk about yours when you first found out that you had been nominated and then subsequently um, won the um, South Australian of the Year. Where were you and how did you feel about that at the time? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it was a, a big surprise. I mean, I was not expecting, I was in the audience, of course, at the awards ceremony, not in any way expecting I was going to win because you look at the other people who are finalists and you think, wow, you know, they're doing fantastic things. And so there's no guarantees you're going to win. And I certainly wasn't expecting to. And then they they called out my name and I had a speech prepared, which you, you have to do. And then I was talking about the fact that diabetes is the leading cause of blindness in working age adults in this country. And I was wanting to take and use this platform to raise awareness of this really critical issue and the need for regular eye checks for patients with diabetes. So that was a you know, wonderful honor and a, a great recognition, particularly for the work that Sight for All was doing and, and, and particularly here in Australia with um, uh, raising awareness of, of uh, this really significant problem in our society. And then leading up, up to the Australia Day weekend 2020, absolutely was not expecting to win that. And, and we all know the amazing story of courage and bravery and Richard Harris, who was Australian of the Year the year before, I didn't think they were going to give this award to another Adelaide doctor. <laughs> and so when, when, and then there were a bunch of things that happened around that weekend. I thought, no, no way, no, it's not going to happen. And, and then it did. And wow, you know, so it was um, a wonderful honor. And I, I really was so excited, uh, not so much for myself, although it's a fabulous privilege, privilege and honor, more to have the recognition of the work that Site for All was doing, because I only won this award because of, you know, what, site for has done over the last 15 years plus and so it was going to be the year where site for was going to be put on the map and then bloody COVID hit and kind of uh, really really uh sort of dismantled the whole year uh you know i became the australian of the year that no, no one know, knows uh and so that was for me it was disappointing i mean it was an incredible year um really for that first few months with that first lockdown the whole year just disappeared. And I had, within two weeks of winning the award, I had a year which was booked up with speaking engagements and amazing opportunities. And that all just went like that. And so I had two months where, you know, what am I going to do with myself? I've got this amazing platform and, and just no opportunity. So I actually created a number of keynote presentations and I started reaching out, being proactive about it because everything else had, had just closed up. And, you know, oh, here I am, Australian of the Year. Do you want to hear a, pot, you know, a, a webinar about this or that? And uh, I managed to resurrect the year and, and it ended up being quite a, a strong and, and powerful year ultimately. Um, but Sightful did miss out on that opportunity and, and unfortunately fundraising flatlined and uh, we still haven't been able to recover yet and hopefully hopefully that will happen. You mentioned fundraising there for Sight for All in particular and, and you know, fundraising for, the, for all not-for-profit organisations is very tight, especially now in the global econ economy that we have. Um, for Sight for All, how, how can people, how can our listeners uh, help and support? Um, because it's a worthy cause and it's a very important cause. What type of, um, what type of things that uh, can we do to help support you and Site for All? Oh, Janie, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we have a number of fundraising platforms. I mean, you certainly subscribe to our newsletter through our website, siteforall.org, and then you'll be alerted to all sorts of things like, um, you know, we have an event coming up in two weeks on the 6th of August here in Adelaide, which uh, our long lunch, our very slow long lunch, which um, uh, we would love to, to have more people coming along to that. And uh, so we have a... Uh, a annual giving program called Vision 1000, where people can donate a, a minimum of $1,000 every year, uh, which is a fabulous uh, opportunity of, of giving back and, and helping to give us that sustainability, not just in the work we do, but also sustainability as an organization. That's really critical. Uh, we have our World Site Day um, uh, initiative, which has been a great fundraising opportunity as well. But events have really been knocked around. This is our first event uh, since 2019, I think. So uh, 
we we also have um you know we we love the opportunity to engage with family foundations corporate foundations because of the work that we do both locally and abroad is so impactful so comprehensive so sustainable it really ticks a lot of boxes for for particularly for corporates and families that that have a giving plan as part of uh, what they do so yeah lots of opportunities i would love for people to reach out to us i'm very happy very passionate clearly about what we do and to be able to talk about it more if you're interested in it but it's uh, when you realize that diabetes is such a blinding issue here in Australia and you know if we look at the stats there we have about 1.8 million with type 2 diabetes and well over half of that 1.8 million are not having their regular eye checks well over half so there's a major education issue a major awareness issue and I mentioned before that Awareness is our fourth key strategy. So awareness is what we do here. We raise awareness. We've created a number of um, uh, commercials and, and videos and short films that we've been getting out there into the community to try and raise awareness and, and encourage people to, to deal with uh, various blinding eye conditions that are impacting on our communities. We, um, we can't let you go today without a couple of covering two very important things. First of all, I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation today, Dr. Muki, that you are currently the Lieutenant Governor of South Australia. What's, what's involved in that role? <laughs> yes. Um, again, that's an amazing honour and privilege. And I think it really came off the back of the, the uh, lifetime of humanitarian work and, and winning the Australian of the Year Award. Um, but basically, we, we are aware of the Governor, Her Excellency um, uh, Frances Adamson. So she is the Governor. And when the Governor is more than two hours away from Adelaide, then I become the Deputy Governor, the Governor's Deputy, it's called. So that's basically the role of the Lieutenant. And she was sick with COVID um, a couple of months ago. And for a week, I actually became what's called the administrator of the state. So I was the second in charge of South Australia after the Queen. So Goodness. I know quite, quite an extraordinary <laughs> thing, which most people wouldn't be aware of. So the, 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 the line of command is actually from the Queen to the Governor to the Lieutenant Governor, the Chief Justice, and then uh, into the political um, uh, contingency. So yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible thing. Uh, so basically, Basically, I'm there uh, as administrator of the state in case there's a constitutional crisis. Luckily, there was no constitutional crisis uh, during that week, but I did have the opportunity to chair executive council on a Thursday morning. That's one thing that has to happen every week is um, signing off on any legislation that needs to be passed. And also, I hosted a number of events that the governor was un unable to attend. And so that, that's, uh, that's um, you know, a really lovely part of the job. But for example, last weekend, I was the governor's deputy for a couple of days and it's a bit like being on call at the hospital but fortunately nothing ever happens and and I just have to kind of behave myself and and uh, and just in case in the off chance something happens that I need to to be called up for but it uh, seems to be that uh, uh, that's a rarity fortunately <laughs> and resist the temptation dare I say to to try to explore an, a loophole or an opportunity to make way for some new signing off of legislation. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I jest, of course, but. Yeah. But I'm hoping that in my role, I can help to improve the health of South Australians um, because mm. we are the state in this country that has the highest prevalence of type two diabetes, you know, a blinding disease, uh, a maiming disease and a deadly disease, which is really devastating lives of people and their families throughout the country. So, you know, much of my work for the last two years has been advocacy around this uh, devastating, life-threatening and life-changing illness. And that work is, is, um, is incredible and what you and your team at Sight for All do do. And especially, as you say, in particular, with, with diabetes being fast increasing within our communities, I think would it be safe to say that um, many of us are a little immune to the fact that these type of um, uh, diseases and health challenges, especially like this one in particular, um, impacts uh, our medical system and our services. So when other challenge, health challenges like the current 
global pandemic that we're in and we're about to hit another peak on that, it impacts on what services can support everybody else, given, you know, if you have more um, pressure on the system uh, for people that do have diabetes, for instance, and need that urgent care. So the work that you're doing and the work at Site for All and, and, and your team and what have you to impact and reduce that is incredibly important, isn't it? It's so important. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the solution to the ambulance ramping crisis is not to buy more ambulances, is to actually improve our metabolic health. We know that 40% uh, of the people who have died from uh, COVID-19 have had type 2 diabetes. That's a, a stat out of America, but I suspect it's much the same here. In fact, type 2 diabetes is a largely avoidable dietary disease, man-made. And the, the best way, in fact, our poor diet is responsible for more disease and death than smoking, alcohol and inactivity combined. So our poor diet is the big driver of the chronic disease epidemic that we're currently in. And um, we can actually improve our markers of metabolic health uh, within a month in about 50% of people just by change in diet, just really, a, in essence, going towards real food rather than this ultra processed food, which is now making up probably close to 50% of the calories of our diet. So we can actually turn this around uh, uh, quite well, I'd like to say quite easily, but it's, uh, it's uh, there's many layers to it that make it very difficult. But it is certainly something that's achievable. And it's what I've been working on and, and feel very passionate about as well. What's in the future for Dr. James Mukey? I'm going to write a book about my experiences. And so you know, I've uh, had a very rich and interesting life and, and particularly the last two years, you know, it's been challenging, it's been stressful. I've had some extraordinary experiences and I want to be able to, to share those with people and, and also share how we can actually uh, move towards a healthier Australia and a, a healthy South Australia, which is being my home state, but I think uh, Australia, we, we really need to change this terrible situation that we're in. And I, I, I definitely have a solution, a strategy, and I'd like to be able to communicate that in my book. What if, if, if money was no object and time was no object and there were no blockages or barriers, what would you like to see happen for change in the right now? I think one of the most important things here is that the ultra processed food industry and the sugary drinks industry, the, these two things are big drivers of our poor health. They're basically getting tax breaks to market their unhealthy products at us, which is making us sick. Uh, and it's a huge drain on the taxpayer, on the government. So if we can uh, uh, basically re uh, remove the subsidies uh, for these companies um, to actually market their unhealthy products at us, then that I think will have a big impact on, on our health. I think just also raising awareness of the preventability and, and reversibility now of type two diabetes. This is a disease that we can actually put into remission. I've had a number of patients now who I've been able to get off all their medications. I've been working together with a nutritionist, um, get off all their medications. They've lost a bunch of weight. They're seeing better. I'm actually seeing uh, the impact on their eyes and their eye health. You know, I'm, I'm for 32 years, I've seen this increase every year in patients who are putting their sight at risk and I'm dealing actively with their vision threatening, what we call diabetic retinopathy. And to actually now see this turn around you know, to start to see regression in the eye disease and the threat to their vision. It is one of the most exciting, rewarding uh, experience of my medical career. So I want my colleagues to be able to share that. And I want the, um, uh, um, the people of Australia, the patients with type 2 diabetes to be aware of this. James, do you think that do, do, the fact that what you've just said, which is that an pricey version, is that you've um, that you can reverse and actually like completely reverse the um, the diabetes? Do you think that that's something that most people don't think can happen, and so they just mull along? Yeah, that absolutely. Makes sense? Absolutely. In, in fact, until early last year, until my advocacy, um, Diabetes Australia, the very first sentence in their Type Two mm. Diabetes webpage was. Uh, type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease. Ooh. I was on the uh, expert advisory group for the National Diabetes Strategy through 20, 
2020 and 2021. And we now, as a result of my advocacy, have remission, see remission is the preferred word, in mm. that document for the very first time. Now, it's not uh, a guarantee for anyone with type 2 diabetes, um, but I have had a patient 25 years with type 2 diabetes off all medications. In fact, I saw him this week. I had an, another younger woman recently who reversed her type 2 diabetes within two weeks she was off her insulin so you know it's it's possible it's not a guarantee for everyone but I think no. it, it's important to have a chat to your GP and aware that that is uh, an option uh, for them you know where I, I think one of the, the critical things and I had a patient again recently who had diabetes for five years and wasn't even aware that it could impact on her vision so this awareness of the complications uh, loss of sight is the, the is the most feared complication. Then amputation due to gangrene is the second most feared complication. Mm. Mm, to me, the most feared complication should be dementia. About 70% of patients with type 2 will ultimately develop dementia. Now, I lost a father to this devastating condition. And so you realise how it impacts not just on the individual, but the family. And, mm. and there are a whole raft of other, you know, 80% will die of a thrombotic complication, such as heart attack or stroke. We don't want the people of Australia to, to go down this pathway when it's absolutely avoidable. Um, I, for one, can't wait to read your book because we could talk to you forever. You, you are an incredibly insightful and empowering individual, very passionate clearly about the work that you do. Um, and you're making such an incredible difference. And this, this um, interview today has not been long enough. <laughs> We're very excited about your book coming out. And uh, I would like to invite you to uh, come on to our Behind the Book podcast uh, for that, because uh, we do want, I'm sure that that will be an incredible read and a must have in everybody's um, uh, household. Before I let you go, Dr. James Mukey, we I always ask this question of all of my guests. And so you are not going to get away without it. Um, if you had an eight year old James in front of you right now, what advice would you give him? Okay. Um, well, at, at the age of eight, I was wanting to do medicine. And uh, it's interesting, I think I'm quite lucky to, to at that age, actually know already that I wanted to do medicine and I would say to him you know you're on the right track mate stick with that it's uh, been a brilliant career for me I've been able to make a difference uh, in the world through through the the fabulous opportunity that medicine has provided and so I would absolutely encourage him to stick with it it's hard work it's a long haul but uh, the rewards are amazing Excellent advice. And uh, not just for eight-year-old James, but for all of our listeners and for me in, as well. Dr. James Mewkey, uh, Australian of the Year 2020, um, and incredible, all the work that you do uh, with your organisation and you personally. Thank you very much for being my guest today on Breakdown to Breakthrough podcast. And we look forward to having you um, when your book comes out as well. Thank you. Oh, JD, thank you so much for having me on your podcast this morning. Congratulations on what you're doing. And I can't wait to come in, back and talk about my book, hopefully, in a couple of years. <laughs> thank you so much. And if you've enjoyed uh, listening or watching this pod, uh, uh, episode of our Breakdown to Breakthrough uh, podcast, we've enjoyed having your company. So please share this because it's very important that we get the word out of all of our guests, of what they're doing. We like to make sure that we bring guests to you that are inspiring, empowering and making a difference. And we haven't let you down with this episode either. Now, do remember that if you would like to just double check on this one as well um siteforall.org.au um, go to that website and you can get more information on Site for All and all the work that Dr. James Mukey and his team are doing, this incredible work. You can also find out their um, events that are coming up, how you can contribute, how you can get involved. And of course, if you'd like to keep up with all of our podcasts, remember, go to janiemorris.com or subscribe, subscribe there or subscribe wherever you're listening right now to this podcast or watching it on our YouTube channel like and comment any questions that you've got dr james mukey will get back to you and of course we will as well in the meantime i'm janie morris it's been my absolute pleasure to have your company today on our breakdown to breakthrough podcast wherever you are in this amazing beautiful world of ours make sure you have an absolutely fabulous day <music>